Okay, let's go to Second Thessalonians. We had a nice trip through First Thessalonians, so let's. Paul still didn't get to go to see this church, so he writes them again. Second Thessalonians. He's received word about them, and now he's ready to move again. Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he goes. He looses the spirit of grace unto you. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Always Paul does this routinely. We are bound to thank God always for you brethren as it is meet or fitting because your faith groweth exceedingly. Remember one of the things he scored the Thessalonians high on was their love and their faith. And now his reports have come back. The first Thessalonian letter has gone out and he's gotten reports back now. And uh, he said uh, we had to thank God it was fitting. It was meat or fitting. Proper thing to do. Because your faith grows stingily, meagerly. That's the way ours does, doesn't it? Sometimes it reverses rapidly, immensely in reverse gear. Now he says their faith increases exceedingly. It grows exceedingly. And the charity of the love of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Faith and love are the hallmarks of the believer's assemblies. Without that, you don't have anything to operate on. Well, there's a lot of people operating without it. That's true. They operate on soul power. They operate on guilt and condemnation. They operate on threats. They operate on theatrical productions. They occupy, they uh, operate on all kinds of, they, they put on a game show. Uh, they do all kinds of neat, lovely things. Uh, nice religious things, of course, sometimes. And uh, they end up with nothing. Nothing that God counts. You see, you have to make up your mind, people, whether you're going to work for and shape your life toward producing that which God values or that which the world values. If you go after the things the world values, you're going to have nothing in heaven. So prepare to enjoy every little tad that you get down here because that's all you get. If you're going to shoot for what God's got, you may have some lean times down here, but you'll certainly have some very lovely surprises in heaven. And down here, you're going to last, oh, 70, 80. You might squeak out 90 years. Ooh. Alice, can you imagine what you'd look like at 90? You don't even want to think about it. Well, my goodness, Alice, you're three quarters of the way there, aren't you? Or something? Oh, I'm, I'm the one. That, oh, okay. I'm the one that's almost there. Excuse me. I, Alice will see me afterwards. What do you mean? I had a birthday tomorrow and I brought it all out there. <laughs> she's got a birthday tomorrow. She said quit being mean because she's got a birthday. You're still having them? I tried to quit having them, but they just keep coming. They just won't quit. You know, have you ever thought about what a blessing it would be to be born on February 29th? Then you wouldn't have a birthday but once every four years. Huh. That'd be kind of neat. That'd mean I'd be 23 years old, huh? Hmm. Was that right? No. No, 16. Or something. Anyhow, they keep coming whether you like it or not. Whether you even count them or not. But the faith and love is to be the characteristic of the New Testament church. Paul talks about it in every letter. And the Thessalonian church scored high. And I have to remind you again, this is a remarkable little church. And it shows you that little is much when God's in it. Because Paul made tents for six weeks at that place. And then he left. Wow. What a place to be in, huh? And yet their faith grew exceedingly. Now remember, these people, they didn't each one have a Bible either. They didn't have a regular pastor. And you know you don't go to church when the pastor is not there. Right? 
Oh, some of you were out the last time I was? Yes, I heard about it. All right. Um, just thought I'd mention it. No, they went because they were receiving blessings from each other. And then when the Lord sent somebody in to share the word with them, they were even more blessed. And Paul had laid a good foundation. And it's very encouraging to know that you don't have to work 50 years to build a lasting work. Thessalonica was a short-term work, but God did an immense amount in, in those month, that month and a half he was there. In Ephesus, he was there much longer. And the Ephesian church was much deeper. But the Thessalonian church was acquainted with a lot of things that churches today don't know anything about. They were all abuzz about the second coming of the Lord. And they knew some things. They were abounding in faith. That's almost absent in most churches. That isn't surprising because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what is there? There's a dearth of the word of God today, isn't there? There's much praising of the word of God, but very little preaching of it. There's much twisting and turning of the word of God, but very little effort just to read it and see what it says. As an old Bible professor I had one time used to say, I think you'd have to read that into the scripture, Mr. Worley. I don't think you can read it out of the scriptures. It isn't there. You have to put it in there. Now, a lot of these so-called preachers that have so-called revelations are merely reading things into the scripture that they want. They get their revelation, then they run hunt a scripture to back it up. I'll stick with God's revelation, I believe, don't you? These others, you know, they haven't been around very long. When these other revelations have been around 100 years, run them by me. Let's see how they've weathered the storm of time. Most of them will be gone, forgotten. Nobody will ever know that they existed. This old book has been around all these times. These revelations have survived the test of time. I believe I'll just stay with Paul. I believe he's straighter than most of us are, don't you? And the revelation that you receive will be within the framework of the truth of this word. You may think you have something fresh and new, but even if it is, if it's really from God, you'll bump straight on, head on into it in some part of the Bible before long. You think, boy, have I ever found out something brand new. I never shall forget one time in, uh, when we were in seminary, I had a homiletics class. See, I know, I know high-class vocabulary, homiletics. That's how you build a sermon. You didn't know I knew how, but I do. I don't do it that way, but I know how to do it. And uh, I had a homiletics class, and of course, all the preachers we had to, they would let you pick a topic sometimes, or they'd assign several different areas, and you could pick a topic from there. And of course, everybody was coming up with a message, you know, and. You had to come up, you had to have so many points, and you had to do this, and you had to do that. Followed all the rules. That's what I don't do when I preach. But uh, at any rate, it's interesting. I, now, when I hear a preacher preach, and he's doing it homiletically, see, I know, because I'm smart. I've been trained, and I know what he's doing. You don't know, but I do. I can sit there and say, boy, he's hitting the points right on there. It doesn't make much sense, but he's hitting them right on the nose, you know. Doesn't move my heart, but he's, he's doing it. Now, there's nothing wrong with it being orderly and everything, but uh, at any rate, we were in the homiletics class, and I remember one fellow brought a message on a particular passage in Scripture, and it was just a super good message. Now, in homiletics class, you usually hear a bunch of duds because uh, professors had a way of assigning topics that were real. <laughs> You know, who could be get, work up any enthusiasm and then stand up there in front of a bunch of preachers picking you to pieces and writing a critique on how you did it. That makes you really feel great. Did you ever have speech class? Well, it's worse than that in homiletics. Anyhow, uh, they're, they're busy critiquing to see if you follow, if you touch all the bases and, and all this sort of thing. And it can be kind of fun. To, but this particular preacher really hit a home run. And we were impressed. I, I stole his message promptly, and so did a lot of other fellows, you know. If you hear a good sermon, the thing to do is jot it down quick and steal it before, before it gets cold, you know. Now I've lost the thing. I don't know where it is, but it was a good one. And uh, 
everybody was impressed. Where did you get that? Well, I was just look, looking at the scripture, and here it is. And we were all so impressed. And then about two weeks later, we're doing some research, and somebody came running down through the dormitory, and he said, hey, and called the guy's name and said, guess what? I found your sermon. A Puritan preacher preached this in 18 something or 17 something. Here it is. Almost the same thing. Now, this boy had not gotten it from this Puritan preacher. And we just all said, well, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. But it was good when the Puritan preacher preached it. It was good when the modern day preacher preached it too. The truth was the truth was the truth. And that's the way it'll be with a lot of truth that people find. A lot of things we're finding, like binding and loosing, have always been there. They may have even been called by different terms than we use today. But they've always been there, but we're just rediscovering some of the treasures that God has buried in his word. We're not going to find anything startling or new. We're not going to be able to hang the sign out front and say, this church has had the revelation Jesus Christ will touch base here at such and such a date. And the 450 foot Jesus will visit our pastor. I wouldn't want to be as big as some preachers and get the 900 foot variety. Lord have mercy. You're going to find that within the framework of God's holy word, you're going to find glorious revelations. And even when you think you found something brand new, even when I think I found something brand new, it won't be long till I stumble into somebody that already, they had it too. We started out across the country with binding and loosing, and every once in a while I'd run into somebody way back in Possum Trot. Possum Trot's right over there behind Skunk Holler, and it's in those piney woods back there. They don't come out too much. They live over there and mind their own business. I've run across some people back over there that said, you know, I'm so glad you wrote that down. The Lord showed us that several years ago. And we thought maybe we didn't have it right, but said you came right out with it. Same thing God showed us. Does that discourage you? No. That's confirmation. God doesn't do these things in a corner. He shows it to a number of people. Of course, everybody's not tuned in. And sometimes people don't have the courage to go ahead and let her fly. But God does. He doesn't do things privately in the sense that he hides it. And only I, just I alone, have this great and glorious revelation. But if you do, you can have it and you can keep it. If God didn't think enough I would show it to more than one person, he must not have thought too much of it. He's got to have more than one child that's got the ear listening to hear what he's saying. And one of the good things, one of the encouraging things is as I travel across the country, I find people who have known this are in their spirits immediately it locks in and they say, my spirit bears witness to what you're saying. And the Holy Spirit is bearing witness of their spirits. This is true. This is the word of God. Others will say, we found out the same things or similar things and are so thankful to hear that others know too. So praise the Lord. And there are other things yet coming. The vagabond spirit. We have the little booklet of Eckhart's in the book room. And it has all the material plus a little more probably than he had time to do in his message. And I'm sure that vagabond spirit is going to be a rich treasure trove to getting people free. I think it's another beginning of another major breakthrough that may lead us into even another breakthrough. So praise the Lord for that. Well, he said, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, because your faith grows exceedingly. Your love for every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. He said, when I go to the churches of God, I say, I'll tell you that Thessalonian church is full of love. And their faith is growing, just growing, growing, growing. Every report I get, their faith is growing and their love is increasing. And this is an encouragement to other believers because it can happen to you. If it can happen in Thessalonica, it can happen to you. If it can happen in Thessalonica, it can happen at Hagwish. Amen? So that's what we want to look for is growing faith, which is based on the word of God, and a love toward one another. And where's that got to come from? Well, that's got to come from the Lord working in our hearts. Amen? 
and the Lord works in our hearts through the word of God and through the spirit it all, it all is one package and he said we glory in you in the churches of God and notice for your patience ooh, you have you had patience recently did patience come to visit you hmm Oh, you thought that was a girl's name. No, no, that's, that's a quality that would uh, be good for us to have. Patience, long-suffering. He said, well, I've got a short fuse. You need to have it elongated. So you'll fizzle a long time before you blow up. And I don't like to have to say that because when I point at you, three of them are pointing back at me and how embarrassing, huh? We all have to ride herd on that. And patience is one of the things that we need. The Thessalonian church had patience and they had faith. But that's because everything was going well, wasn't it? I mean, everybody, as the song said, anyone can sing when the sun's shining bright. But you need a song in your heart at night. And they were having these glorious things happen to them in the midst of tribulation and persecutions that were being not enjoyed but endured. Ooh. Well, if I'm going to be a Christian, I want to have a happy life, you will, with persecutions. Paul writes in another place, you or Jesus, I believe, in one of the Gospels said, you will have these blessings with persecutions. It's part of the package. And he says, your patience and faith came out and were given an opportunity to flower and blossom in the midst of your persecutions and tribulations that you were enduring. Now, this is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. They were suffering for the kingdom of God. What do you suffer for? For being proud, arrogant, dumb, stupid, lazy, wasteful. Now, if you suffer for those things, you don't get any blessing. But if you suffer for the kingdom of God, said you will have faith and patience given to you to go through these things. I'll tell you what, looks like we're going to have to have to rerun that test. Patience, faith, plus persecutions and tribulations. Now, if you just could be patient and have faith and everything would be fine, everybody would be on board saying hallelujah. We're on the hallelujah trail, right? Uh, but when you add in the persecutions and tribulations, oh me, how many times did you flunk? Well, it won't do you any good to flunk. You're not going to flunk out. You just go back to the tail of the class and you start all over working your way back up. You'll have to take the test over. And by the way, there are no social promotions in God's business. In our schools, you know, when I was a kid growing up in school, if you didn't pass first grade, you stayed in first grade. One, two, or three years, however long it took. So you were ready for second. Nowadays, the poor little things, it bruise their little personality. Let them be two years older and three heads taller than all the other kids in the first grade, you know, to keep them in there. So they, they social promote them. They'll tell the teacher, just give them straight D's and pass them. But they're not D students. They can't read, they can't write, they can't do arithmetic. Well, pass them anyway. That'll be the second grade teacher's problem. And it'll be the third grade teacher's problem, and the fourth grade, and the fifth grade, and the sixth grade. And they'll probably drop out when they get to be 16, old enough to drop out sad. It's called social promotion because it's very important that you be socially acceptable. Even if you're as ignorant as all day long. <laughs> At least you can be socially. I mean, if you're going to be ignorant, you want to be ignorant among your peers. You certainly don't want to wait until you've learned the lessons. It's so sad. And so we've got a whole generation of kids who can't read, can't write, can't spell. Can't do arithmetic. 
They can watch videos. They can tell you what happened last night. On, they can give you a report on the, on the TV show last night. If they tell it, they can't write it. They don't know how to express themselves on paper at all. We've become Ill functional Ill illiterates. The average newspaper is written on a fifth grade level. You say, I don't have any trouble reading the newspaper. Well, I hope not. Because if you do, you, you are having problems. If you didn't know that now, some of you are saying, boy, I'm glad you told me. I was going to complain about not being able to read the newspaper. I don't believe I'll say anything now. It's written about fifth or sixth grade. You know why? Because our standards have dropped so. And even teachers who want to teach are not allowed to teach. They're covered up with paperwork. And with parents, he's saying, my little Johnny is a perfect angel. They have noticed the horns every time he combs his hair. They stick out. <laughs> they just will not believe their little darling would do any of those dreadful things. It's that dreadful teacher. Always picking on my Johnny. Well, you get your little Johnny straightened out and the teacher won't have trouble with him. You know, I, my parents had a strange philosophy. You know, we had teachers, and I'm sure we had good teachers and bad teachers. We still do. I mean, I never have known anything be all right. You can't all have all good teachers like Alice down here. See, I'll try to brag on you once in a while. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just marking it down. <laughs> they, uh, but, you know, when I went off to school, my daddy had to talk with me first. I didn't go to kindergarten because it cost me extra to go to kindergarten. And we didn't have any extra. So I waited till first grade. And my daddy sat me down. He said, now son, while you've been here at home, you've been taught to mind your mother and daddy, haven't you? Yes, sir. I never said, yeah. Ooh, that would not have done. That was not proper uh, speech. I said, yes, sir. He said, when you go to school, you're going to have a teacher who is an adult and you will respect them you will say yes ma'am and no ma'am or yes sir and no sir and you will not be sassy to them because you know what dad does to you when you get sassy to me or to your mother yes sir he said that's exactly what will happen if you get sassy with your teacher and you're not always going to like everything the teacher says or does, but you will do it. And if, if by some chance you get in trouble at school, when you come home and your mother finds it out, then she will give you a spanking. And when I come home, I will also give you one. Because we intend for you to get along with your teachers. I never had a minute's trouble with my teachers. I didn't. I bit my tongue. I wouldn't say anything because the thought of a double, a double treat when I got home, forget it. And I knew that just as sure as the sun rose in the east and sat in the west, my daddy was certainly telling the truth. And I just didn't have trouble. And there were people, there were kids, their mamas were always running to school. Oh, they were having their kids having trouble. Not me. Mm -mm. I worked and I gritted my teeth and I didn't like that teacher but mm -mm. and she asked me something yes ma'am I was deceitful but I valued my hide now, if you can't do it for the right reason you learn to do it just because it's right and it'll help you now the only thing that does for you see it just makes you stunt your growth makes you a little runt when you grow up other than that, I don't think it bothers you too much. Stood me in good stead, though. I spent my time studying and learning instead of fussing with a teacher and trying to figure out how I could get around it because I knew my hide wouldn't hold shucks when I got home. If the school reported I had problems. My, my, my. You think I wanted my folks to come home and find that out? No, sir. My children didn't have any trouble in school either. We didn't even have a whole lot of trouble in church. 
except I don't have to tell this about Joy. One time she had a pretty little red purse with a chain on it. She's about 10 years old. <laughs> and she was sitting in church, and there was a little boy sitting next to her. And she found out if she put her purse on her head and let the chain hang down, then she'd drop it off. He just went into hysterics, you know. <laughs> and he was just hysterical, trying to keep from laughing. I was preaching. And uh, she was putting her little red purse on her head, <laughs> dumping it off, <laughs> little chain dangling under her chin. <laughs> His parents were looking down at him, you know. Well, I caught, I saw it. And right in the middle of a sentence, I said, I'll tend to you when I get home, Joy. And then I went right on preaching. She said she had a, an attack of rigor mortis. She lost interest in her little red purse. And she prayed fervently, oh, Lord, let me die right now. <laughs> and on the way home, she prayed fervently, maybe he'll forget, but he never does. And I didn't. And she never played with the little red purse in church anymore. <laughs> See, there's a way to correct these things, but you you got to keep your word to your kids. If you tell them, if I told her I'm going to get you and I'd let her buy, she'd have been trying that little red purse again. Just on the chance maybe she'd get by with it. But the little red purse, she got in trouble with some other things, but not the little red purse anymore. One time we were gone, Alice stayed over at our house with the three kids. And I put a sign on the ice box, no hassling has Hosselton, <laughs> while we were gone. And uh, because I was gonna hassle them when I got back if there was any problems. What am I saying? I believe that we ought to learn how to behave ourselves. God expects us to behave ourselves. The Thessalonians were behaving themselves and they were producing a tremendously impressive record of faith and love and they were able to endure persecution and tribulation because they were concentrating and majoring on, my, on majors and not on minors. So many times people get to majoring on minors. They get to nitpicking, nitty picky, nicky picky, nicky picky. I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like the other. Well, if you do that, you're never going to be happy. And you're going to spend all your life picking little nit. You're going to pick the lint all the time and you'll never, you'll miss all the good things that are going on. Pick out the major things and concentrate on those. That's what they'd done in Thessalonica. Uh, so this is a manifest token of the judgment of God that you're counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Uh, you say, well, some Christians never suffer. They're not counted worthy. Did you know that God doesn't trust everybody with suffering? You get rewards for suffering and going through it victoriously in Jesus' name. Some people are so namby-pamby they can't take anything. They say, oh, I have a hangnail. I've got to go to bed and watch TV and hope it gets better. I couldn't drag myself to church with a hangnail. I've got to hold it up like this. But it won't hinder me from doing anything else. I can eat good. You know, it doesn't help, keep me from doing anything else I want to do just from going to God's house. Now God's not going to be fooled by that kind of stuff and I don't think we ought to be foolish enough to think he would be. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had a lot of people trouble us, haven't we? The witches have come against us, still do. And they trouble us, and it pleases God to recompense, to pay off tribulation of them that trouble us. God counts this as a righteous thing. And he, help, he lets you help load the bucket. Psalm 109, let him that loves cursing receive it again unto himself. I don't want it cluttering up my house, my life. 
or my family or my church. I want it to go back where it was sent. And if the Lord wants to recompense them and give them a bonus with it and charge them COD when it gets there, that's all right with me. And I know that he does this. He recompenses tribulation to those that trouble you. That's one reason we can always know that the devil's crowd is going to get it. One way or the other, God is going to get their knitting. The thing they love the most is going to be taken from them. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Now there were some Thessalonians who got a little troubled. They got tired of being hassled by the enemy. You ever get hassled like that and get tired of being hassled? And he says, you can be rest, you can take rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He said, there's coming a day of reckoning. This thing's going to be summed up one of these days. And Jesus is going to come and be revealed in heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's not very loving, but it's very necessary. For those who turn aside from the grace of God, they get the other side, which is judgment. And he said, don't forget that your Lord is coming with his mighty angels with flaming fire and he's going to take vengeance on all those that do not know God and those that don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with temporary destruction. Hmm? Manifest sons of God, people tell us they'll go in there and preach everybody out of hell. My Bible doesn't say that. My Bible says it's going to be everlasting destruction. If they ever get in there, they're not getting out. And if those manifest sons get in there, they won't get out either. They better get on the grace train and stay there. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They will never be restored because God is going to come in flaming fire. They will have their day, their opportunity, and when they reject it and reject it and reject it, God will take vengeance on them. We won't, but God will. I'm kind of glad God's going to do it, aren't you? It takes a load off my shoulders. I don't have to. He's going to take care of it. And he'll do a much more thorough job than I could anyway. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints... Did you know that Jesus is going to be glorified in his saints? Now, who are the saints? Well, first of all, they're not the ones the Catholic Church calls saints. There's a bunch of saints sitting in here tonight. You say, I haven't seen any. Well, you haven't looked around. Because being born again makes you a saint. Now, all saint, you're a saint by virtue of position in Jesus Christ... All saints do not look saintly, nor do they always act saintly. But they will one of these days. And he's going to be glorified in his saints who are going to be completely washed and purged. Did you know he's going to present us to the Father without spot or wrinkle? You say, how is he going to do that? I don't know. I don't even understand how he saved us in the first place. Do you? I know he did. I can can give you the theological terms, you know, that, that he saved us by grace through faith. And the faith is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. I can explain all of that. But I really don't understand how he could do that. But if he could do that and bring me from darkness to light, it's not going to be any problem for him to wash me white as snow. And present me to the Father without a speck or a trace of sin. That's all going to be left behind, friend. When you and I are presented to the Father, there won't be a speck of anything on us. Matter of fact, we're going to be kind of dazzled ourselves. I'm going to look at myself and I say, wow. I look at Mike Dunn and I say, Mike, I never thought you'd look like that. Huh? And we'd be looking at each other saying, I never dreamed that you'd ever look like this. Some of you are going to look up and say, I didn't think you was going to make it. <laughs> but everyone will be washed in the blood 
made spotless by the finished work of Jesus. Not by anything they've done down here, but by the finished work of Jesus. And we're going to be spotless and be presented to the Father. Won't that be a hallelujah time? And uh, he's, he's going to come to be admired or glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. When we look around and see all the hundreds of thousands of people that he has washed in his blood, we're going to admire him with an admiration that's unbelievable, that's, that's not in our power to attain right now. When you get there, you're going to admire him. When you think back of what you came out of and what you have, just to be there without a reward, without a mansion, and those are all coming too. But even without those, just to be in his presence, just to be perfectly clean, just to attain that absolute cleanliness and holiness that you had such a hunger for ever since you got born again and never could quite get there. You're going to admire him. You're going to love him. You're going to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Like the song says, I keep falling in love again, over and over again. Over and over again. And the reason is going to be because as we look at him and his beauty, we're going to see we're reflections of his glory. You say, well, we know each other? Well, certainly. I mean, you're not going to know less when you get to heaven than you are know now. You're going to know more. And you recognize each other now, don't you? Well, you say, I don't see how I could be happy in heaven if some of my loved ones weren't. Well, now, Jesus loves those loved ones better than you do. And he's able to be happy in heaven when they're not. You see, we're going to understand things as God understands them, as Jesus understands them then. And our whole frame of reference is going to change. And we'll be able to understand exactly why it works, how it works out. <clears throat> he said he'll be admired in all them that believe because our testimony of you among you was believed in that day. And Paul said, you know, I'm going to have a part in it because you believe the testimony I gave. And that's the reason some of you are coming in, because you came in with the message that I gave. Every part that you have in helping somebody get to Christ, every prayer that's led of the Lord to help. Uh, The last trips that we've made to Indonesia, we've seen so many people saved in those meetings. As well as being delivered, the people are flooding in now to be saved. And fully one-third or more of the people, Rob, isn't that right? About a third or to a half of the people that come. And sometimes that's 100, 150 people will just flow forward. And they want to be saved. You get to talking with them, and they want to be saved. Sometimes while they're waiting, they get, wait to get saved. They'll go into convulsions. Demons will start screaming out of them. So the last trips we've made, we've had to divide them off and and put some Indonesians there that knew the language and could take them through the plan of salvation and get them saved. Then they transfer over and put them in deliverance right away. And then we took the ones who were ready to be delivered and went on, and it worked very well. But those of you who stayed here at home and prayed and made possible the outreach by your prayers by putting guardian angels all over those meetings, all those airplanes and everything else, you had a part in everything that happened. And when you get to heaven, some of those Indonesians are going to run up and hug your neck and say, I've been waiting for you to get here. You say, well, I don't believe I know you. And they'll say, oh, no, you never met me. But some people from your church came, and you were one of the ones that prayed. And I asked Jesus to let me know every time somebody from Hagbush that prayed came because I wanted to run up and hug your neck and thank you personally because it was because they came that I'm here. Wow. You talk about fun and games. We're going to have it. Amen. It's going to be something else. You're going to have people running up that you never dreamed about and saying thank you. Then you're going to find other people who are going to run up to you and you'll say, you're from Hagwish, yes. Well, you know, I'm sort of a third generation 
so and so got saved then they led so and so to the Lord and then they led me to the Lord and so actually you had a part in getting me to the Lord too and I just want to thank you Jesus told me he'd let me know when people from that church came because they paid a price so that I could know Jesus and I could be free people are going to run up and hug your neck and say I was freed from demon bondage and my life was destroyed and then it was put on a rock with Jesus you came out of that church and Jesus told me you were one of the ones who prayed you kind of wobbled a little bit but you did pray and you did, you did help a part and I want to thank you see people we, we, haven't, we're not, we haven't got all the results in yet it's not all in yet all the tallies not in it won't be in until those days now you thought you didn't have anything to look forward to amen just think when we get to heaven so many things so many times you sent a book so many times you gave a witness and you walked away and you didn't know whether anybody ever heard you wrote a letter you sent a track you just prayed you heard somebody needed help and you just stopped where you were and said Lord help that poor woman I don't know what to pray about her, but just help her and meet her needs in Jesus' name. And maybe the Holy Spirit hit like a bombshell and changed the life. You're going to find out about those things when you get to heaven. Isn't that something? Praise God. So don't ever think you're going to be on the back side of the list and, well, I didn't do anything. Well, if you don't, it's your fault. If you stay by the stuff at home and you go about your business and you pray and you help get the speed the word out then God's going to take note of all of that and there are rewards attached to those things and you're going to say Lord you didn't have to do that but he wants to he wants to well because of our testimony among you was believed in that day wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. What's he praying for him? Here's You want to know how to pray for people? We pray always for you. What do you pray? That God would count you worthy of this calling. What kind of calling did they have? to abound in faith and love in the midst of persecution and tribulation to be able to overcome those things in Jesus name to receive eternal reward keep eternity's values in in view the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ's name be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God if it's according to the grace of God how much is it going to be it's going to be enough wouldn't you think yes sir now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit stock market crash wars rumors of wars now he doesn't say all that but it's the same thing we are to be steady and although we watch these things we're not to be shaken out of our teeth by them for we know these are only harbingers of the future don't be shaken nor troubled by spirit that's an evil spirit did you know evil spirits can prophesy are you aware of that you should be papers are full of evil spirits prophesying in every astrology column Irene Hughes prophesies Dean Dixon prophesies in a lot of churches there are evil spirits that are busy prophesying and they say thus saith the Lord and thou and this and they and thee put in King James English it's bound to be from God do you know that hmm no 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 it's not bound to be from God it has to be checked by the word of God and also the spirit by which it comes has to be checked 
you've heard some things here that came through in the, in the congregation where every word was right and yet there was a spirit in it that made you feel uneasy and you didn't feel comfortable with it. That's because an evil spirit was driving that person. They may have had a real spirit of prophecy, but it was being overridden and infiltrated and adulterated by an evil spirit to mess it up. I've been in services where somebody started out prophesying and it was pretty good. And you kind of perked up and you said, oh, I'm going to listen to this. This sounds like maybe the Lord is speaking. And then toward the end it would, it would slide off and there was just bitter condemnation and hatred and, and vicious attack on the people. And who do you guess took over then? Another spirit. He said, don't be shaken by those spirits, nor words, nor letter as from us. He said, even if you get another letter supposedly written by me, don't you be shaken by that, that the day of Christ is at hand. Did you ever hear something like that? Oh, the Lord's coming. I'm right. Sometimes the magazine's right. It'll tell you the exact day Christ is coming back. What do you know about that immediately? Evil spirits. Because Jesus said that no man knoweth. The Father alone has the date for his return. So the minute a man says, I know the date he's coming back, he's lying. He said, I heard a voice. You probably did. I'm sure they did. Sounded like an angel, probably did. Since you don't know what angels sound like, you can... I would think an angel would come with a full orchestra, wouldn't you? Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, the hallelujah chorus going in the background. You know, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Or something, you know, then you'd believe that's an angel speaking, you know. Don't think the devil can't dress things up so you'll believe him. But he says, don't let anybody fool you that, by, that some spirit comes and tells you some word comes or a letter that's supposedly written from me that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let any man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. This is an interesting statement. The man of sin is undoubtedly the Antichrist. More literally, the instead Christ. Some people are thinking that Antichrist is going to be different from Jesus. He will be, but he'll try to appear like him, at least in the beginning. He comes to take his place. And the instead Christ will come, the man of sin, son of perdition. Now this is why some people believe that it, this man of sin possibly might be Judas. Now let me hasten to say this is speculation. Do you know what speculation is? That is theory, unproven ideas. Interesting. But for some of you that want to do some digging, there are three scriptures that you can find that may get your little brain wheels turning. It was said that Judas went to his own place Nobody else in scripture was given a specific place to be put. It talks about the Antichrist being from the God of his fathers. And he uh, come out of the, uh, possibly come out of the tribe of Judah. And of course that fits Judas to a T. Judas is also, Judas and the Antichrist are the only two critters in the whole Bible who are called the son of perdition. Antichrist will be, uh, there are many spirits of Antichrist in the world now. Many of you have talked to Antichrist, haven't you? Dealing with deliverance, you've run across spirits that, whose name was Antichrist. And Antichrist, we found out in the book of Daniel years ago, always comes with two spirits called power and strength. And those two spirits must be dealt with or you'll never get Antichrist to budge. But uh, Antichrist will all be come together and be in a man, be concentrated 
in one man. Jesus was God in the flesh. Antichrist will be Satan in the flesh, almost literally, as nearly as, as, nearly as Satan can make it. You have to realize, you know, Satan's a copycat. He's just trying to copy the Lord. He's like a little boy who's trying to outdo his daddy. And he just makes some of the biggest botches trying to fix it. And uh, some of his creations are kind of, they are near copies. Others are pretty botchy. And uh, he's going to create, set up a man. Jesus was a man, right? He took a man's body. Then Satan needs to come into a body and so inhabit it that he will have the power to be Satan in the flesh. Satan incarnate, if you please, in the flesh. Now, uh, like I said, if you want to look that up, you'll find Judas is interesting because he's called the son of perdition and so is the Antichrist. The only two people in the Bible who are called that that I know about. Now, this man of sin, whoever he is, and by the way, I've lived long enough. I've seen Antichrist uh, proven every year. Somebody writes little booklets proving that so-and-so is Antichrist. Kissinger is Antichrist. That was very popular back. Well, I'll agree with you. He acts like him. But I mean, you know, um, and other other men on the national scene, Mussolini, Hitler, and all right on down, you can find all through history the leading advocates of insanity in government have been branded. This is undoubtedly the Antichrist. And they certainly all have traits of it, but you roll all that mess together and the Antichrist is going to be more and more than that. And he will take over the world eventually. And Antichrist will come. He'll be revealed. He'll oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God now let me spin off something this is what the Antichrist literally will be on the earth he's literally coming he will be a literal person and he will be filled with satanic power as no man has ever been filled with satanic power in the world's history there is a type or a picture here a useful spinoff of Bible truth did you know that demons who's the temple of God right now is this church building the temple of God is it where is the temple of God the body of the believers this is a church house right now the church is here Tonight, when the last light's out and we close the doors, last person's gone and it becomes a church house. Right now, the church is here because the believer's bodies are the temple of the Lord. Now, look at this again in view of what we know about demonic powers. Opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's caused God, that is worship, so that he, think of this as a demon now, sitteth where in the temple of God showing himself that he is God did you ever have a demon that bossed you around or should I rephrase that do you have a demon that bosses you around who sits in the temple as God and takes over and directs you to worship him and do what he wants even though you don't want to do that I think there's a picture here a type or a shadow of the believers the temple of God being occupied by strange critters now this is talking about a literal man who will come to a literal temple which doesn't happen to be in existence by the way at the moment but it doesn't take long to put one up does it and he will sit in that temple and show himself to be God you go through history you'll find several startling illustrations of this and um, but I think one of the most interesting things is this idea that he sits in the temple of God as God and demands worship 
Worship demands obedience. Demons require that you be obedient to them. Do they not? They want you to do what they what you they tell you to do. Now remember not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. He'd already talked to him about the Antichrist. He's going to have them all messed up, isn't he? Now we're going to stop there because I, I don't want to spend more time on the next verses than we have right now. We'll just stop right there. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure about it, wouldn't you like to ask him into your heart tonight? Make sure. If you're not sure, come down the aisle and say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. Somebody will sit down on a one-to-one -one basis with you. Check out what you claim as your basis for salvation. Check it against the word of God. If it checks out, then you're home free. If not, you can get on the right track tonight. Either way, you gain. You don't have to go away filled with doubts and fears. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, or reversing spiritual growth and progress, you're talking about the work of demons. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We believe in the whole thing. The table is spread tonight for evangelism, deliverance, and healing, and the gifts of God are available for those who want them. Now, God does not chase you down. If you want deliverance, you can have it. If you don't want it, he's not going to chase you down and hit you over the head with it. If you can live with your demons, friend, they're not bothering me. But if you're sick and tired of being like you are, I'd advise you to seek help. In Jesus' name, let's stand and sing something about that name if you need help.